Joining me now is uh, Michael Anton, uh, contributor to the edited volume, a uh, former communications director at uh, the National Security Council and currently a senior fellow at the Claremont Institute, Jeremy Carl, a uh, former deputy assistant secretary in the Department of the Interior and a senior fellow at the Claremont Institute, and Matt Peterson, uh, who is the uh, founding editor of uh, The American Mind. He's looking at me to make sure I get this right. <laughs> Founder of a venture firm and currently uh, the executive editor of Blaze Media. Uh, we will start with Michael Anton, please. Push something? I guess I do. So I won't read to you. I'll just keep it here so I can see it. These are Arthur's instructions to me as to what to talk about. He doesn't actually have any power of the purse over me, so I can probably say what I want. He doesn't have a lot of recourse, but I try to be a good colleague and, and, and do what's asked of me. So he wants me to talk about how the left, how first of all, how it took over everything, why it's held on so tightly, and what we can do to you know, shake it or... I, Okay, so how? Um, I'm actually researching this a bit now. There have been a million books written about this. You can find them easily. Uh, Roger Kimball's The Long March, um, picking up a phrase from the civil, Chinese Civil War in the 1930s. Anyway, but I, I'd give you an analogy of how. Because I'm, I'm researching this for another purpose, and one of the things I'm looking at is, um, for reasons I won't go into, the history of student takeovers of buildings in the 60s and thereafter, when this became a thing, like you go into the building, you have a sit-in, you occupy, you have some kind of demand. Eventually, uh, typically, I would say more than typically, probably 99 out of 100 times, the university caves and gives you everything you want. Um, there's even a movie that I, 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 I recently watched about this that I had never heard of, and it was called The Strawberry Statement, totally forgotten, 1970. It's about a sit-in at an unnamed Bay Area university. How did they do it? Well, if you read about it, they're, they're actually fairly clever. Most of these buildings, at least in those days, they're just open, right? There's a bunch of different doors. You walk in, you got to file your papers. You got to There's got a lot of reasons to be in there. So you have a conspiracy with two, 300 people beforehand, and you trickle in over the course of a few hours. And once you've reached critical mass, you sit down, you block the doors, you start chanting, you break out the signs and so on and so forth. But just one at a time you go in. This is the way that they, in effect, took over. You do it very quietly. You don't announce your intent until you have physical control. Um, this is the way, in a, in a sense, that the left took over a lot of our institutions. They, nobody comes in saying, we're going to take over the university and make it into a left-wing anti-American hate fest. It's just you hire one person at a time as quietly as possible. They only when you have critical mass does the real agenda reveal itself. Or in another context, similar, but I, and this is an anecdote I approve of. Um, some of our, our friends and teacher, a Harvard professor, retired now named Harvey Mansfield, had to keep his head down for a long time until he got tenure in 1965. And when he got tenure, he wrote a telegram. That's how long ago this was to his mentor, Leo Strauss, that says, yeah, achieved, or I forgot exactly what the word was, but I definitely remember the second sentence. And there were only two sentences, one word, like achieved, and then the second one was, now we run up the Jolly Roger. In other words, now that you can't touch me, back then tenure was taken seriously, now I will reveal who I really am and I'll start giving Harvard uh, a headache on a daily basis, which he managed to do for about 40 years, 60 years, I should say. So this is the way they take it over, very slowly, right? Under the guise of um, fairness, freedom, free speech, and so on. When there's critical mass, then you announce yourself and you change the rules, in a sense. If anybody wants to get really depressed, um, don't recommend, but read what it's like on a university hiring committee these days or what you have to do to pass muster to get hired. Forget, or just to get, even forget to get hired. Just to get an interview, just to get past the first round in a university committee, it's almost impossible. And it's changed extremely rapidly just in the past, let's say, three years. Okay, why have they held on? Well, okay, I think that was part two of my charge. Um, they've held on because they waited to achieve critical mass. And once you've achieved critical mass in a given institution, it's you can be fairly hard to dislodge. So who's going to kick them out now of the universities or of the major newspapers or of the foundations or of you know, uh, I've, I've worked at three Fortune 50 companies. Now, you would think, this is to piggyback on something Senator Vance said, you would think these people, these companies, these institutions, because they're profit-making, right, they have to be responsive to the bottom line, they have to be responsive to investor concerns, they have to be responsive for the public who pays their 
who buys their product. And yet they're overwhelmingly just as left wing. They're not quite as bad as, let's say, a women's studies department at Oberlin College. But there's, a lot, there's more in common with a Fortune 50 boardroom and a, and a, and a, and a mid-tier sociology department than you might think. Um, we've seen some positive signs recently. Disney appears to be suffering because of pushing too much woke fare, alienating its customer base, and so on. Uh, I, 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 you know, I'm trying to, I'm trying to see the uh, the light at the end of the tunnel. In that, I guess Bud Light suffered, Anheuser Busch via Bud Light has suffered a little bit. Mostly, though, these companies haven't paid a price, and because once there's critical mass, there aren't a lot of levers. There's almost nothing you can do from the inside, and there aren't really that many levers that you can. Uh, utilized from the outside. To take the universities, for example, the main lever people would have over the universities is boycotting them. Don't send your kids there. Don't pay the tuition. I can tell you from experience as someone who's a big sap that I am paying the tuition right now for one of these places, like no one's doing that. No one is yet willing to say to their kid, you know, don't go there or I refuse to let you go there or anything. Nobody's boycotting. And we'll see what happens to Harvard and Penn and MIT. They, they appear to be going through a rough patch. Uh, one of them, I think, is right now without a president. Maybe two more soon will be, although I think Claudine Gay is going to survive at Harvard. That's my estimation. But, you know, hey, they haven't suffered like this in a long time. So maybe that's something uh, to look forward to or something to be optimistic about. Another reason, though, why they hang on is because they've seized. I don't I don't I mean this only in the sense of perception, right? They've seized the moral high ground. They occupy the moral high ground. Not literally. I don't think they hold the actually true moral position, but they sound like they do. And they're always able to couch whatever they want or whatever they do or whatever their priority is or whatever this action that appears to the rest of us to be hypocritical, they're always able to couch it in terms that sound extremely moral so that the regular person that Senator Vance was talking about, not the think tank egghead, right? Not the engaged political participant, not the campaign volunteer, the regular constituency who just wants the chemical train explosion in their town cleaned up, when they hear this moral language, they go, yeah, it sounds fair. That's about right, right? And the egghead comes in and says, well, let me write. I can write 10,000 words about why my vision of justice is, is different from theirs. It doesn't get through, right? The, the moral revolution in the way we're supposed to understand the relationship between privilege and non-privilege, between the underdog and entrenched power and all of that gives them... Um, an incredibly effective tool, even when people sort of have misgivings, like should the six foot two, 200 and town, 10 pound hulking person of ambiguous gender actually be competing against five foot four uh, biological women? You know, common sense says, nah, probably not. That doesn't seem right. But if you frame it as a moral issue, as the civil rights imperative of our time, as I think the president called it before he was president. And if you, if you guilt people and shame them into thinking that, you know, you're, you're, you're against progress, you're against the disadvantaged, they, they can kind of, I, I think maybe not fully genuinely, but they can be made to feel misgivings that overcome their common sense. And at a minimum, if it doesn't fully convert them, to this cause, it makes them kind of recede into the background and say, well, I'm not going to raise a stink. I'm not going to raise a stink about that because it, it makes me look bad. And I'm actually not even sure that I'm wrong. So holding that moral high ground or that moral whip hand is very important. What could we do against all of this? Well, since we're in Capitol Hill, we're in the Capitol or I don't know, we're underground somewhere. Um, uh, I, I can think of two things that members of Congress could and should do that they almost never do. Right? One is just don't give them any money, right? You have power of the purse. Um, I, I teach a class, we all do. I teach for Hillsdale College, and we're all supposed to know something about the Constitution. Well, it's somewhere in Article One. It says that not only does only the Congress, that is the Senate and the House of Representatives, have the power of the purse, only ultimately the House of Representatives has the power of the purse, right? I can show you where this is. If you don't give them any money, they can't spend any money. And yet whenever some controversial, horrible thing comes up or, or the worst behaving departments in the US government, the Senator just mentioned the Department of Justice, right? Which controls among other things, the FBI. Whenever one of their bills comes up, the Republicans always vote to give them more money, right? So they, they gave the FBI some huge raise. I'm not gonna say the number cause I'll forget it. And then everyone will jump on me. You know, you were one digit off or whatever. Um, not only did they give, expand their budget, but they, uh, all voted, I don't, I'm sure some people voted no, but anyway, it passed to build them a gigantic new sparkly headquarters 
in the DC area, right? Given all the malfeasance we've seen come out about this particular agency in the last seven years, they don't deserve any of this. And yet the Republicans can't stop it, right? And even if you can't stop it, I would say if there are any Republican members in the room, I'm looking at you. Even if you can't stop it, at least vote no, just symbolically. Just put yourself on the record saying, okay, this is going to get smashed through anyway. There's nothing I can do. The leadership is for it. They've got the votes, whatever. But I, in good conscience, can't put my name on it. But they always go along. And I can, we could point to a million more examples of things that Republican elected officials know are wrong, that their constituents don't support, that if it was explained to those constituents, they would especially not support, and Republicans pay for it repeatedly anyway. The other power, this is really more for the Senate side, although there are levers that the House side could push, is over personnel. Stop voting to confirm people who say they're going to do bad things in the U.S. government. So again, J.D. Vance teed this up for me. Thank you, Senator, right? He's talking about airline pilots. Well, we have a sort of similar issue on the military side where the last chief of staff of the U.S. Air Force recently became the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. It's the highest uniform position in the United States military. And he said, and one of his top, if not his top priority as Air Force chief of staff, and it will continue to be uh, as the head of, well, he's not really the head of the whole military. It's complicated the way the joint staff operates. But, um, you know, his priority is to diversify these ranks. Now, as the senator said, f fine with that as, as long as we're diversifying consistent with high standards and, and high, um, you know, and without any diminution of standards, without any lowering of qualifications. But when that just diversity for its own sake becomes a priority, you're no longer selecting for that, you're going to have a problem. So this general was, uh, at a, you know, very loudly, clearly on the record what he wanted to do. And... Big stink raised, a lot of outrage, a lot of concern, a lot of controversy. And what happens in the end? The Republicans all just roll over and he was confirmed with like 85 votes or something. I forgot what it was, but it was over 80. Nobody stands up and says no, right? Either say that you're not going to do this, that you're going to prioritize qualifications, readiness, the ability to defend the United States, carry out military missions, or you don't get our vote. But we lay down every time. So these are things that could be done from this building by the elected members who serve in this building in complete accordance and keeping with the constitutional duties of their offices and with the oath that they take. And in my humble opinion, having never served in Congress and never will, uh, they uh, too seldom do those things. And I, for one, would like to see them do it just occasionally would be a good start. And then increasingly, and then universally. Thank you. Uh, Jeremy Carl. Thanks very much, Arthur. Um, so I flew up here from uh, Montana over the weekend. Uh, I'm going to talk about immigration a little bit. Um, and I, on the way back from the airport, I had an Uber driver from Afghanistan. And I like to chat up drivers. So I was just sort of talking with him. And we had a really good talk. And I asked where I'm from. I said, I'm from Montana. I uh, said, oh, I have friends in Missoula. And uh, I actually knew about that because we had a recent resettlement of 130 Afghan refugees in Missoula. And Montana being a small state and not a particularly diverse state, that was sort of a newsworthy event, a significant number of refugees. And sure enough, not that long later, there was a rape case involving one of those refugees. Um, now, we never consented for that refugee resettlement, although this was legal immigration. You know, I did do. Um, Congressman Rosendale uh, from uh, Montana had actually objected to it. The governor objected. But honestly, there's not much we can do. And... Yeah, I'm sitting here in Montana saying, well, do we control our own country? Do we control who really comes here? And I really think it underscores to me that immigration is the fundamental issue, the first issue that transcends all other issues, because it goes to really the heart of who are we as a people? Like, and do we get to choose? Um, and it's a battle that I think we as a nation right now are losing. Uh, in October of this year, we hit 15% uh, uh, immigrant population in the United States. That is the highest in history, uh, higher even than the, the, the Ellis Island era. Um, and uh, that's both legal and illegal. Um, and it wasn't always this way. I mean, even not before I was born, 1970 census, we were 4.7% immigrant. Uh, in 1960, the median age of immigrants was 57. Uh, immigrant, uh, median age of native born Americans was 27. So you had few older immigrants and that was kind of it. 
Um, 84% of those immigrants came from Europe and Canada. Today, we have immigrants, legal and illegal, from everywhere in the world. Uh, under Joe Biden, we've had a 4.5 million net increase. Uh, that's according to the Census Bureau. Estimated 2.5 million, according to my friends at the Center for Immigration Studies, of those are illegal. Those numbers are historically absolutely unprecedented, that type of increase. Uh, Gotaway numbers, similar thing. We have 137,000 per month right now encounters uh, at the border. That's bigger than the biggest city in Montana. Um, uh, we had about 42,000 a month by comparison under Trump, which is hardly zero, but you're talking about a, a more than 3x increase. It's even twice as many as we had under Obama. So it's a dramatic change. It's not business as usual. Now, of immigrants who become citizens, more than 60% of them are Democrats, just a quarter are Republicans. You do the math of what that looks like. So given the importance of the issue, I'm going to just talk about four different things. Uh, one, I'm going to talk about the conceptual big picture. Secondly, because we're on the Hill, I'm going to give you a few thoughts uh, on what we can do with current legislation, followed by sort of long-term strategic goals, and finally, sort of long-term practical things that we could do uh, if we have the White House and when we have the White House again. Um, a conceptual big picture, uh, how should we think about this from the perspective of, of Congress if we want to make change? Well, A, absent substantial changes for immigration law, not just enforcement promises, but law, we shouldn't be doing any deals. Um, any solution that gives discretion to the immigration bureaucracy, I think we fundamentally lose. If we create new law, we might win. If we create facts on the ground, then we win. Um, and we shouldn't put our trust in fences. Uh, right now on our side of the border in Arizona, we've got huge numbers of illegal aliens camped out, basically waiting to be picked up and to have their bogus asylum claims, and they are almost all our bogus, processed and then just disappear into the interior. So having a wall, I'm not trying to say having a wall is not important, it is, but it is far from sufficient. Policy is more important than a wall, and personnel is more important than policy. That's how I think about immigration most broadly. So what does that mean short term practically in terms of uh, the current uh, bill we have sort of in front of us right now, the current debate? We've had immigration uh, twinned with Ukraine. There's been a lot of discussion about whether that is kind of useful or not. Um, even Mitt Romney is kind of saying no deal, you know, on anything with immigration uh, if you want your Ukraine money. Uh, if that's true, if we can really get everything we want that was basically in HR2 uh, in this Ukraine bill, then, then fine. That's a trade I'm willing to make. Um, but if not, I just know our history as a party. I'm really worried we're going to give up uh, fundamental things and then, uh, as a result, give also tens of billions of dollars to Ukraine, with regardless of the merits of it, is not something that is uh, popular with an increasing number of GOP voters. So what should be the things in that sort of a bill? One, I think parole is the most important thing. So you have to reform the parole issue because that's how you actually release people into the interior and then they're kind of never seen again functionally. Uh, it's much more important than asylum. And it's not a coincidence that the Democrats have been willing to do deals on asylum, but not really parole. Uh, secondly, some of the smaller loopholes when you deal with asylum, things like credible fear and what a particular social group means uh, in the law, whether that means domestic violence or being in a bad neighborhood is included in that, uh, which we should certainly say no. Um, those are things the Democrats have even indicated they have some willingness to move on. Obviously, those are mandatory. Um, again, I'm going to get a little bit wonky, but the Flores loophole change, TV, uh, PRA, uh, things where basically these both involve uh, what you deal with, uh, minors, uh, the idea that if a minor is not from Mexico or Canada, we can't, kind of can't do anything with them if they show up, as opposed to what we should do, which is just call up their embassy and be like, hey, we've got somebody from your country. You need to go deal with them. Um, similarly to Flores, uh, right now, a, a basically a judge for the last uh, long period of time has made it that if you show up with a minor, it's basically a get out of jail free card and your whole family uh, if it's even a family in, 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 in every case, uh, gets released into the interior, we can stop that legislatively. And to me, those are sort of minimum uh, goals that we should have. Um, we can dramatically increase the enforcement budget. Uh, much of the completely ridiculous things that the Democrats do on immigration, or they say, oh, well, we're just using our discretion. So if you give them a ton of money to actually just for enforcement, then the discretion argument becomes a little bit uh, harder to, to swallow. Finally, we should empower states to enforce immigration laws. You're seeing a little bit of this, particularly down in Texas, in Florida, a little bit in Arizona. Um, you know, will the Democrats really risk with our current border? Are they going to send federal troops down to Texas and say, 
we're going to start arresting uh, and I knew Michael was going to say yes, um, uh, arresting people who are just trying to enforce the federal laws that they won't enforce. I think they may try, but I think if we're smart, we can make the optics of that so bad that it becomes toxic even for the Democrats. So that's that's short term. Uh, create facts on the ground. What do we do long term conceptually? Well, first, I think we have to puncture the nation of immigrants myth. Um, that's literally has its origins in a Democrat campaign slogan in 1960. If you read my chapter in the book, I kind of go all into sort of the history of American immigration, uh, which is not what most people think it is. Um, so you can see some of my other talks on YouTube. Um, we also need to have a, a candid look at what worked and what didn't work under Trump. Under Trump, de deportations increased. The border was certainly more secure. Remain in Mexico policy kept hundreds of thousands of bogus asylum claims uh, from being uh, from being adjudicated here. Uh, refugee numbers went down to 15,000 from a high of 80,000 or so in the Obama administration. Parts of the border wall were strengthened. That's all good. But there was little fundamental long-term change. Despite really smart people and folks like Stephen Miller giving really good efforts, um, there was no mass deportation of illegals. There was no meaningful legislation passed, again, despite efforts. Um, most of these accomplishments under Trump have been undone and more by President Biden. We even failed, again, not through lack of trying, to end Obama's blatantly unconstitutional DACA executive order. Um, and uh, so I think there's no way we can win ultimately on this immigration issue if we simply play under the current rigged system. And this kind of gets back to the old way of doing conservatism in which advocacy groups, resettlement agencies, and, and lawfare kind of dominate policy. So what's a solution? Well, we can take a page from President Lincoln. And President Lincoln, um, and, and you start by doing things like challenging the power of district judges. This is now if we control uh, the White House uh, to issue nationwide injunctions when they don't like something. Uh, Lincoln argued against judicial supremacy in uh, the Civil War. He took Dred Scott. He took ex party Merriman um, when the court attempted to limit his authority. And he said, basically, with good legal opinions, he said, you know what, I'm just not going to do that. That's nice that you have that, that opinion. Uh, and that means that what you need, uh, Noah Feldman of Harvard Law has argued that even the Emancipation Proclamation was probably a constitutional violation, certainly not a moral violation, but a constitutional violation. So the question is, are we going to talk about the left's version of a constitutional violation? Or are we going to make the correct legal arguments to do the things that we know are the right thing to do? We need to rescue that spirit of Lincoln, that also means my number one priority is an aggressive council, White House counsel's office in the next administration. People are really going to be unafraid to, to kind of push for uh, these very fundamental changes. Um, so on a policy perspective, what do you do? Uh, you de-bureaucratize -bu uh, immigration claims. You take authority away from immigration judges. Quote, unquote, they're not real judges. You do things, simple things even, like for asylum claims, Everything is heard by three asylum judges. You need all of them to say yes before you can get in. Even just doing that little thing would get rid of a lot of bogus things. We need to remove the temporary protected status uh, program entirely as opposed to kind of doing this country by country thing. We've got 400,000 illegals right now, people who wouldn't be here illegally except they've been given temporary protected status. What does temporary mean? Well, it's running on 34 years for Somalis. 25 for Hondurans, 25 years for Nicaraguans, 15 years for Haiti. Doesn't really feel so temporary at this point. Um, finally, I'd say we need to consider, and this really gets to, to things that Senator Vance would say, what I would call the nuclear option. And this is really an up from conservatism uh, thing from a conservatism that always loses. Um, I think the Department of Justice, day one of an our next administration, needs to open up a January 6th style investigation of the activities of the Biden administration and immigration and their state enablers and criminally prosecute, if they find appropriate evidence, administration officials who have broken their oath of office and intentionally violated the law. And I'm very, very confident, by the way, that if you start doing FOIA communications, you're going to find a lot of things where uh, you're going you're gonna to have that happen from uh, Secretary Mayorkas on down. Um, and I want to be clear, what I'm talking about here is not criminalizing policy disagreement, okay? The left is not going to agree with us on immigration policy, and that's fine. I'm talking about prosecuting the criminal behavior that is going on right now of the Biden administration who refuses to enforce the duly in enacted laws of the United States because they feel that it will hurt them politically. And until you do that, until you make people personally pay on the left for 
blatantly flouting laws, not just by losing an election, but by losing their freedom, you're going to have the same sorts of bad acting from the left that you always have had. There need to be real consequences for Democrats who engage in the sort of criminal behavior that we have seen, unfortunately, from this administration and their enablers often at the state level. And when you do that, when you have those sorts of real consequences, you're going to get the change you need. So with that. Thank you, Jeremy. Uh, Matt Peterson. So uh, anyone paying, paying attention now uh, knows that in America, there's very few elite professions or corporations allow their members to safely dissent from woke dogma. Um, everyone knows this. Everyone knows they risk their job or career if they do so publicly. Worse, uh, we know the views of roughly half the country are increasingly opposed, suppressed, delegitimized uh, by major corporations in key sectors like tech, finance, and media. Um, as we learn more and more every day, big corporate increasingly works directly with the administrative state to spy on and deplatform, debank, on person, and otherwise attack dissenting political, cultural organizations, citizens, and political movements. That's where we're at. So, first off, it's suffice it to say, if we're going to talk about the economic war, we've already lost this battle, right? We did something wrong. We've lost big corporate. That was supposed to be republic. It's gone. So now this is a time to, to, we have to, and this is what this book is about, we have to wholly rethink our approach if we're going to have any hope of winning. So the way I look at this is there's no easy path to victory. There's a clear, but there is a clear strategy moving forward. It's not complicated. Um, but victory is not going to be possible unless we first boldly and publicly acknowledge that our economy is a political and cultural war zone and act accordingly. So uh, Arthur, he gave me two conflicting, uh, conflicting orders. One was to keep it within the time, and the other was to explain how we got here. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to skip the how we got here part and go to the other half, what we should do. Uh, but suffice it to say, uh, I am very confident in arguing that the founders, the Republican Party of Abraham Lincoln, uh, the Whig Party, Henry Clay, the American system, Teddy Roosevelt, all of those people in the past did not talk about business the way that we do now. Uh, it is very new to consider business a neutral space, um, and, and uh, they would have issues with the way in which the conservative movement has talked about it post-World War II. But let's look forward. There's two paths forward. One is, uh, it's a pincer movement, if we're going to stop woke capital. One is legal and political action, and the other is a new commercial cultural movement, intense competition, and, and radical acceleration, accelerated innovation. I'm going to speak mainly about the first today because of where we are. I think the second is ultimately the way you win, but the first, the political and legal action, is necessary to hasten and unleash the second. So the first line of attack, the first thing we should talk about is, is, is very simple, and I can't really emphasize this enough. People, very smart people in this space, do not, uh, do not grasp this in the way that they should. Internalize it. We need to use the weapons that are already available to us. Here's one of the big problems. Until recently, the right just hasn't tried very hard at this stuff. And there's no greater example of this uh, than what has been going on in the last few weeks in your daily headlines. So listen to this. This is probably more important than any of the intellectual stuff I say. Elon Musk recently said this, quote, Media Matters is an evil propaganda machine. We are suing them in every country in which they operate, and we will pursue not only Media Matters, but anyone who funds Media Matters. They should go to hell, and I hope they do. This is a guy who also declared war on Disney, right? That's the right mindset if you want to win the war. Uh, you, you don't bend, you don't break. You go on the attack instead. And people know this. The voters know this. Musk has become a hero to half the nation. But here, here's my point. As soon as Musk sued Media Matters, right, in the last few weeks, he inspired a host of right-leaning media companies and tech companies to follow suit, to do the same. And more are going to follow his lead. OK, so why didn't we do that years ago? Why haven't we done that already? Everyone's going to follow his lead because he, he planted the flag and he did something. And the truth is, whether it's free speech, whether it's antitrust, whether it's tortious interference, whether it's um, common carrier laws and regulations, uh, there are plenty of avenues already available to protect consumers and attack the, the, the corporations now wielding power against them uh, to further their political agenda. The, the lack of will uh, to deploy them is, in my opinion, our, our first problem. So 
If you jettison the blinders of the past and you engage in a kind of full-scale economic war that corporations are already waging against the other side, against us, you will unleash the talent and creativity of politicians, policymakers, and lawyers at a much greater scale with much greater effectiveness than anything we've seen so far. And that's already happening. We need more of it. There's been state attorney generals in states like Texas, Florida, Missouri, elsewhere. They've proven that you can, you can win using the framework of existing law, whether it's filing suits against Google for antitrust violations or the Biden administration for colluding with big tech. Uh, these things are popular with voters and even many donors alike. So if you join the fight, that, you know, that's the first step. Use existing law. Second, there's plenty of areas in which new or radically reformed laws and regulations can reshape the commercial landscape for the better. Obvious measures, uh, pushing anti-ESG legislation, forbidding banks from discriminating against their customers. Uh, red states have to stop giving billions of taxpayer dollars to corporations that hate them. Uh, that means pulling out large amounts of money now in the hands of BlackRock and other large investment vehicles that have weaponized the trillions of dollars they control. Uh, there's been some you know, headway there, but that needs to become the norm across the nation for the right. Same principle should apply to all large state contracts with notable businesses that oppose and attack the interests of American citizens and state residents. All special arrangements and giveaways that state and local governments have designed in the past for corporations given to them, the corporations that are actively opposing the interest of their residents, of American citizens, we need to re-examine those special carve-outs, right, and take them back. The idea that that action violates conservative principles is so absurd to me. I mean, strict libertarians have been talking for decades that special cutouts for businesses distort what should be a level playing field, right? So getting rid of them should be applauded. What, what, what DeSantis did should be applauded with Disney. The entire complicated landscape of our free market is already a distorted and corrupt war zone with states like California and New York ceaselessly rewarding their friends and punishing their enemies. That's what they do. Uh, so fighting against this will, will raise awareness of the problem. And, and if you do some of the things I just mentioned above, you'll also create an ecosystem where you, can, where you can foster and reward alternative businesses and financial institutions that aren't doing these things, right? Which can start, cap they can start capturing market share from their uh, competitors, the worst offenders. Another thing, obvious, but needs to be done. It's starting to happen, but not enough. Uh, in the past, we relied on the discipline of boards and shareholders uh, as a trustworthy lever to limit the political activity of a company, right? Uh, but many corporate boards have long since been co-opted by activists. Acknowledge the reality, the real impetus behind, behind the cries for diversity on corporate boards in California and elsewhere is simply to leverage power for political purposes. And you have a tangled web of NGOs, politicians, political organizations. They've succeeded over the years to take over, I mean, think about this, even the industries they despise, such as the energy sector. So there's no reason, the good news is, there's no reason in principle that nonprofits, politicians, political organizations on the right could act in a similar manner to the left in this arena. There's only lack of will. Um, you know, there's, there's tons of examples I could take, but to take one example of something that could exist that would put the right pressure, uh, why, why isn't there a consumers union right now that represents tech platform users and advocates on their behalf? Harmeet Dillon and I proposed that in 2019. Uh, she didn't have time and neither did I. But such an organization would file a few high profile lawsuits a year. It would break down the ever changing terms of service. It would educate consumers about their rights and tech privacy practices, rank social media platforms, call attention to their worst actions, right? It, it'd be like a legit version of a, of a media matter. It's actually serving uh, people, consumers unions. The idea has been around forever. Where is that? That's just one example. There's a ton of new things like that that we could see, we could see coming and we need to foster. But here's the controversial and the most important thing that I'll say about the legal and political problem. And the thing that Congress must do to fight off woke capital is address its root legal cause. No one talks about this. That's our corrupted civil rights regime. Why are companies woke? It's baked into the cake. Our laws, our institutions, and our culture have long since baked in the necessity of allegiance to elite-sponsored wokeness and identity politics. Although the initial Civil Rights Act was sold to Americans as a way to ensure we judge individuals by the content of their merits, it metastasized into a system based on the opposite notion. By law, all workplaces must now take racial and many other identities into account, and they hire, fire, and promote people accordingly. The system is not neutral. Moreover, it's partly run, not just by the woke commissars in the businesses, but by an ideological federal administrative state and its corollaries in the indiv individual states themselves. So, you know, here's the hard news. There can be no real victory until the right takes aim at the massive body of rules and regulations that emerged uh, and created the woke human resources regime, wrongly established on the basis of the 1964 Civil Rights Act. 
that provides the commissars their command centers in every major business in America. It's become a tyrannical tool of radical ideology. We all know this. We must no longer require that race and other identities be taken into account in the workplace. Now, I know what you're thinking. Dismantling that complex is such a monumental task uh, that many would despair at the attempt. But there's no longer any way around fighting the weaponization of race and sexual identities in the workplace. If there's, there's no way around it. If there's any hope of saving America, that's what you have to do. At the very least, okay, after saying the most radical thing, at the very least, the concept of disparate interest, which practically means that any inequality is the result of oppression and must be rectified accordingly, needs to be publicly dismantled by revisiting and revising all of that Civil Rights Act legislation that's been wrongfully built upon the 1964 Act. The, the right it can rest assured that despite the success of its enemies, millions of regular Americans and business leaders still value excellence and despise the working environment they now find themselves in. They want to get out of it. What's required to help them is a brave new political movement that takes direct aim at that body of law. Uh, and, and to do that, you have to, you have to accurately describe the problem. You have to reject the, the rhetorical straitjacket the left has put us in for decades. The framework we're talking about has nothing to do with race or sexuality, but the question of whether we still value excellence and competence. So we need to argue that woke HR is not merely inefficient, but it's fundamentally unjust and morally wrong. Now think about this. Uh, again, I'm going to go back to Musk to, sh to shame the right. The most successful businessman in the world recently declared, unless it is stopped, the woke mind virus will destroy civilization and humanity will never reach Mars. If Republicans can't say the same and explain why and act on that, they should not expect to defeat woke capital and they don't exist to deserve as a political party in my opinion. If, however, Republican leaders begin to take action, and we see some signs of this, um, if they start taking the sort of political and legal action, rethink the framework of how they talk about these things, and they start to move in this direction, which the new right is trying to push, that will serve the purpose not of, on its own, uh, defeating the enemy, but it will unleash the other side of the pincer movement we need. It'll hasten the rise of a new commercial cultural movement in the private sector based on competition, innovation, and excellence. People have already started to get out from under the control of woke capital. Um, you know, the, the same forces driving geographic migration that you see right now from blue to red states apply even more so, with even more force, to the one-party controlled workplace, marketplace, and digital technology platforms. Anyway you count the numbers, you have millions of people who as a group would constitute one of the largest GDPs in the world who want to stop supporting companies and cultural institutions that hate them. You know, half the nation wants alternatives. I, I'm part of that movement in the private sector now, expanding Blaze Media, which will increasingly shine a light on all the above. There's a lot of work to do. Uh, members of the private sector need to be roused and given a vision and purpose, and the political action that I'm suggesting could help that. But ultimately, only they can put together the historic levels of talent now available that wants to break out to meet the increasingly ravenous de demand of people for the new tech, media, and financial institutions we need. And that's not only the single business, single largest business opportunity in our lifetimes, that's also how we're gonna save America. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, give our panelists a round of applause, please.